Welcome back. We now look at torsional stress and strain. That really means the stress and the strain experienced by something like a shaft when it is experiencing torque. So if we take a solid shaft and we cross-section it, we would have a drawing like this. There's the circular shaft that's been cross-sectioned. Now what happens is when this shaft is transmitting torque, it experiences a maximum stress in its outermost fibers over here, a shearing effect. Just like if you were to grab the shaft with two hands, resist with the one hand and twist the shaft with the other hand, you would be applying a torque to that shaft and in exactly the same way the fibers, the outermost fibers would experience the biggest shearing action. And if you were to go inside the shaft and move closer and closer to the center, that shearing action or stress would get less and less until it was actually zero at the center. So with that in mind, the shear stress tau is proportional to its position outwards from the center. In other words, at its, whatever its radius is. So x over r, x being the distance out to a certain radial point, divided by the total radius, would give you that proportion and if you were multi to multiply that by the stress in the outermost fiber tau you could find the stress at any particular radius that you desired. So next is we're going to break up this cross section into elementary rings or slices and we're going to look at what torque each of those slices is carrying and remember there are an infinite number of these slices as you go along because they are elementary, they are of negligible thickness. So if we consider the stress on the one that I've drawn over here, this elementary ring, and we work out the stress where it is, is x over r times tau, the maximum stress, and we multiply the stress where it is multiplied by its area, we would get the tangential force that is acting on it and once we multiply that by radius we will get the torque carried by that elementary ring so here's the tangential force which is stress times area area being circumference the, the length of that if it were to lay, be laid out into a straight line multiplied by its width dx and we multiply by a further x value to get us to torque and that brings us to this point here and then we sort things out a little bit over here and we get the constants to the left and the variable x is on its own and it's x to the 3 and then we get the total torque using integration and we note that the variable changes between x being 0 and x being a maximum of r and we integrate x cubed to be x to the 4 over 4 we apply the two limits, r and 0, so this term here becomes 0, and all we're left with is t, correction, 2 pi tau over r times r to the 4 over 4, which simplifies to that. We would prefer to work in diameter rather than radius, so we change from radius to diameter, and we get to this point here. So in summary, if we apply a torque to a solid shaft, we can use this formula to find the stress in the outermost fiber, the maximum stress experienced by that shaft. If it were a hollow shaft, the formula is slightly different, but the principle is the same. You need to know, obviously, the outside diameter and the inside diameter, capital D, little d. And in the same fashion, the maximum stress would also occur in the outermost fiber of the hollow shaft. Of interest, the hollow shaft has no point where the stress is zero. Remember in the solid shaft, the stress was zero at the middle. In the hollow shaft, there is no material in the middle. So the stress would simply reduce to a lesser value by the time you got to the inside diameter. Now would be a good time to attempt these three examples. So I strongly recommend that you stop the video and make a very good attempt at these three. And once you have an answer for each of those, or answers for each of those, then watch the rest of the video to see the solutions. In the first one, we've got a solid steel shaft transmitting 2 megawatts 
at 220 revs per minute. So immediately from that you can find what torque it's transmitting. And the shear stress for the steel, we're not allowed to go above 260 megapascals, bearing in mind that's ultimate, which we're going to then factor with a safety factor of 4. And we're also told that the maximum torque fluctuates to 18% greater than the mean torque. So the torque you work out there would be the mean torque. You must add 18% because of the nature of the machine. During operation, they tell us that it goes 18% higher at times. So we must allow for that in the design. And we must find the required shaft diameter. So power is 2 pi nt over 60. So torque, the mean torque, would be 60 p over 2 pi n. Turns out to 86.8 kilonewton meters. Add the 18%, we get to 102 and a bit kilonewton meters. Formula for a solid shaft says torque is pi over 16 d cubed tau. And we find that knowing 260 megapascals divided by 4 is our allowable stress, the shaft had better be 0.2 meters in diameter. Exactly the same, but for a hollow shaft, external 55 millimeter diameter, internal 35 millimeter diameter, once again power and torque and a 15% fluctuation above mean we must allow for. Determine the greatest shear stress in the shaft material. So once again, work out the mean torque, 60p over 2 pi n, add the 15%, brings you to 1568. Formula for a hollow shaft, there it is, and solve for the stress. In the outermost fibers, this shaft would see 57.44 megapascals. Now comes an interesting one where we compare solid shafts and hollow shafts. Now just before we get into that, the myth that a hollow shaft is automatically stronger than a solid shaft is obviously nonsense. It is mass on mass, so for the same mass it might well be stronger, but if the solid and the hollow had an identical outer diameter there's no ways that the hollow can be stronger because you've removed material from the inside. So with that out of the way let's look at this example. It says a solid shaft of 160 diameter must be replaced by a hollow shaft of the same material and same mass per unit length with an outside diameter of 220. So it is bigger this one than the solid shaft but it's got a hole through the middle. For the same maximum shear stress in both, how much torque can the hollow shaft transmit in comparison to the solid? So if the two must have the same mass, it follows that their cross-sectional areas must be the same. Okay, and the cross-sectional area of a solid, pi over 4 d squared, hollow, pi over 4 d squared minus d squared. Those two can cancel and we're left with that and we can solve for the required inside diameter of the hollow shaft. Next, let's work out the torque that can be transmitted by the solid shaft for a given stress. Pi over 16 d cubed tau gives us pi over 16.16 cubed times tau. So we have in the formula stress. For the hollow, exactly the same thing, and we end up with a similar result. Now, remember, we don't actually need to know the stress at this point because we are making comparison. So the torque carried by the hollow divided by the torque carried by the solid would be all of that upon all of that came from there and there and now the two stresses which after all we were told must be the same can cancel out and we're left with a number very close to two and that simply means that the hollow shaft is twice as strong as the solid shaft for these dimensions and having the same mass per meter. Now we get to the matter of torsional strain remember what strain was in normal linear terms it was change in dimension over original dimension now in a similar fashion we have torsional strain so to illustrate that let's consider a shaft of length l subjected to a torque t so something is resisting this end of the shaft and something else is rotating this end of the shaft clockwise now line a b from here to here was originally a straight line drawn on the shaft. It stands to reason that after the torque has been applied, that point A has moved slightly to that point C, and point B has stayed stationary because it's locked on that side. And this would indicate that some 
torsional strain has occurred. Now there are two important angles. Theta is going to be referred to as the angle of twist of the shaft, that's this angle here. And there's going to be another angle which we're going to use as well. Phi, which will be the angle that this line AB turned through about point B. Next we look straight onto the end of the shaft, a 2D image of this little piece over here would be drawn like this, AC, center of the shaft, there's our theta. And then we remember that the length of a sector is equal to the radius times the angle turned through in radians. That would give us that distance there. So in our case, AC is equal to radius, which is D over 2, half of that, times the angle theta, obviously expressed only in radians. Multiply that out and you would get the, the distance AC. Next we go onto the outside of the shaft and we look at the triangle A to B to C and we note that tan of phi is AC over AB. But now that angle phi is likely to be a very small angle and we know that tan of a small angle is equal to that angle in radians. You can try it on your calculator, set it to radians. Put in a small value, now small is not defined, but maybe one or two degrees, something like that, converted to radians, and take tan of that value, and you'll note that it is very similar to that value expressed in radians. So we can drop the tan at this point and simply say that phi in radians is equal to AC over AB. Now, shear strain is this little distance divided by the distance between the two shear planes in question, which would be from here to here, which is distance L. So that would be shear strain, AC over L, but L is the same as AB, so AC over AB. But if we go back here, we note that AC over AB was in fact our shear strain. So we can make it all equal to each other like that and end up with our equation three, which says shear strain phi is equal to AC over AB and then we can take 1 and put it into equation 3. So wherever we see an AC we can replace it with all of that. Here was the AC so we replace it with all of that. We can replace AB with L and we can simplify slightly and say that shear strain is equal to phi in radians and it's also equal to theta which is the angle of twist multiplied by d over 2l. Now if you go back to chapter 8 you'll remember that modulus of rigidity was stress over strain and it was denoted by the capital letter G. So G is stress over strain and we're talking shear so it's shear stress over shear strain. Rearrange that slightly to get phi is equal to tau over g. So tau over g must be not only equal to phi, it must also be equal to all of this. So tau over g is equal to that too. And you can also express it like this, that tau is d theta g over 2l. Two examples for you to try on the work we've just done. So stop the video now and attempt both of those. And once you have the solutions in front of you, continue the video and check your answers. In the first one, it says the angle of twist in a certain shaft is to be limited to one degree over a length of 22 diameters. Okay, just another way of expressing length. That's whatever the diameter is, multiplied by 22 and you've got the length. If the modulus of rigidity G of the shaft material is 79 gigapascals, determine the shear stress induced and then B the required rotational speed if this shaft has a diameter of 160 millimeters and must transmit 250. Right, we have a shear stress formula that relates to the dimensions and the modulus of rigidity and of course the angle of twist. 
and we need to find that shear stress so the diameter we put down times the angle remember it twisted through one degree we must convert to radians always so one degree times pi over 180 to get it to radians there's g and underneath we have two times the length now the length we were told was 22 diameters now luckily for us these two can cancel and we're left with 31.34 megapascals next let's work out the torque that can be transmitted and compare it to the formula for stress and torque okay now p is 2 pi n t over 60 so t is 60 p over 2 pi n so we're going to take the 60 p over 2 pi n and put it over here and make a comparison between these two then 60 p is 2 pi n is equal to pi over 16 d cubed tau okay so 60 times the 250 kilowatts over 2 pi times that rotational speed which we need to find out is equal to pi over 16 diameter cubed times that shear stress that we worked out earlier so for all of this to happen we're going to have to rotate it at 94.7 revs per minute in number five we are told that a shaft must transmit 80 kilowatts at 100 revs per minute and the shear stress may not exceed 66 megapascals we're told how long it is and all we are told about the diameters is the fact that they are in a ratio of 2 to 1. So first step is to find out those two diameters. So we write down that D is 2D. We were told that. We'll use that at some point. We're told that power is 2 pi nt over 60. We already know that. So T is 60 p over 2 pi n. So there's the 60 times the power over 2 pi times the rotational speed. So 7639 is the torque. Don't forget to add the 26% for those fluctuations. So we've got a design for 9625 Newton meters. Using the hollow shaft formula and noting that the outside diameter is twice the inside diameter, we can get down to one unknown, basically the, or just the inside diameter. And we can ultimately solve for it at 0.046 meters. We then apply the fact that the outside diameter is twice that and we get it too so now we've got both diameters all that's left is to find how much it will twist knowing that its modulus of rigidity is 80 gigapascals so we go and get the formula for twist as it relates to shear stress so at 66 megapascals with diameter outside of 0.0925 remember that's where the maximum stress occurs that's the only diameter we're interested in in this formula times angle of twist times 80 times 10 to the 9 that's that's g modulus of rigidity over two times the length and we find that the twist is this many radians we multiply by 180 over pi to get 2.25 degrees now our final little piece of theory for this section is that of polar second moment of area now if we take our solid shaft in cross section once again and we consider the second moment of area not about an axis through here or through here like you've used before but an axis from here straight out of the page towards you that would be called the polar axis and the polar second moment of area is the second moment of area about that axis straight out towards you from that point and that is necessary to know so as to be able to derive the shaft formula which is this extremely useful formula we're going to finish off with shortly and polar second moment of area is normally denoted by the letter j and as before we take an elementary ring in this case we work out the area of the elementary ring as 2 pi x dx so that would be circumference if you had to snip the elementary ring and lay it out straight it would be 2 pi x long and if we multiply area by distance to axis squared, remember we are then dealing with second moment of area, and that's what we've done here. And we can simplify it slightly, get the x times x squared to x cubed. And then we can use integration to get the total second moment of area. Remember there are many, many elementary rings all the way along here. And to get the total, we could say integrate between limits of 
r, x being a maximum of r and x being a minimum of 0. And what are we integrating? 2 pi x cubed. And we would then take the constants out and get x cubed to change to x4 over 4. Apply the two limits. The second limit is 0, so that will fall away. And wherever we see an x, we put in an r. And we end up with this. And then we note that we want to work in diameter rather than radius. So we replace radius with d over 2. And we get to this situation here where the polar second moment of area of a circular shape is pi over 32 d to the fourth. And incidentally for a hollow shaft it looks slightly different. There it is there. Now we do a bit of manipulation of two formulae that we are familiar with already. Let's call it formula 1 and formula 2. And we put 2 into 1. So wherever we see a tau we replace it with that in 1. So we're left with t is pi over 16 d cubed and where tau would have been we replace it with d theta g over 2l. And we can rearrange that further to get pi d4 over 32 times theta g over l. And at this point we note that conveniently this little piece over here, pi d4 over 32, looks exactly like that over there. So we could effectively put 3 into 4, so take all of that and put it into this formula here. And we could be left with t equals, instead of pi d4 over 32, we can have a j times theta g over L. We can move the J under the T and we can end up with this over here. And then we can apply the final step and note that theta G over L is in fact equal to tau over radius. So we can put that in as well. And then we end up with what's known as the shaft formula. Extremely useful formula. This equals this equals this. Write that down as the shaft formula. There's an example, as usual, stop the video and work that out, and then have a look at the solution. So using the shaft formula, or part of it, t over j equals tau over r, we can find this maximum stress very quickly, because we know that torque over j, that polar second moment of area, is equal to stress, the thing we want, over the radius to the outermost fiber which is 0.06 divided by 2. Remember the diameter to the outside was 60, so half of that would be the radius to the outside. And we find very quickly that the stress in the outermost fiber is 45.27 megapascals. Remember this value here is maximum stress, which would always be at the outermost fiber. Shear strain we learned a bit earlier was theta d over 2L. So there's your theta, obviously put in as radians always. There's the conversion from degrees to radians times diameter to the outermost fiber over 2 times the length of 1 meter, they told us. Gives us the strain. Remember, it's a unitless ratio. Shaft formula again. To find g, you know all the other variables, and you can find g at 77 gigapascals. D, the power transmitted at 200 RPM, well that's very easy because P is 2 pi and T over 60, you can simply work it out at 37.7 kilo. And then finally, an interesting one, it says the minimum shear stress in the shaft. Now remember that this is a hollow shaft, so nowhere is it zero, but it is least at the inner diameter. So using the shaft formula again, you simply put in the radius that you are at and you will immediately get the stress that corresponds to that radius. So 1800 newton meters of torque over the polar second moment of area is equal to the stress that we desire and we put in the radius where we want that stress and remember that is at the inside radius which was diameter 30 millimeters you must divide it by 2 to get to radius and you find that 22.64 megapascals is the stress at the innermost fiber. Remember at the outermost fiber it was a lot more at 45.27 megapascals, but nowhere is it zero. And another example for you to practice with, stop the video now and work it out and then have a look at the solution. 
So number seven relates to that age-old comparison between hollow shafts and solid shafts. And remember we discussed earlier that there's no ways that a hollow shaft of the same diameter as a solid shaft is any stronger. It would not be because there's material removed. However, if you are able to tolerate a bigger diameter, then you can definitely make it stronger for the same mass. Or conversely, you can make it have less mass for the same torque transmission. And here in this one, we've got to determine the percentage saving in mass if a hollow shaft in which the ratio of diameters is one and a half to one were to replace a solid shaft of 300 millimeters diameter. And the torque must be the same and the shear, must, shear stress must be the same in both. So we go back to the torque stress formula for solid and the torque versus stress formula for hollow. And remembering that the torque must be the same in both they tell us, so we can equate those two. And the pi over 16s can obviously fall away. And we're left with this equals this. And then we also note that for the hollow shaft, the ratio of outer to inner diameter was one and a half to one. And from all of this, we can find the two diameters, 0.2152 and 0.323 meters. So as you can see the hollow shaft has to be a little bit bigger in diameter to compete directly with the solid shaft of 0.3 meter diameter. Right now what mass do we save? Well the mass is proportional to the cross-sectional area. So the mass saving you could work out by subtracting the lesser from the bigger and dividing it by the original. That would give us a change or a saving in mass. So pi over 4 times 0.3 squared would be the cross-sectional area of a solid minus the cross-sectional area of a hollow divided by the cross-sectional area of a solid because we're making comparison to the solid. So it would be a 35.4% saving in mass. And to finish off here is one more example, which is exactly like the ones we've done. But this is to finish off the section and you can practice this on your own. So once again, stop the video after having and have a look at the solution once you've made a good attempt at this one.